What if there was a Survivor game that was good? Like, what if there was a Survivor game that was really, really good? Here's how it could be done. If you're watching this video, I'm assuming to at least some extent you've fantasized about playing Survivor. You've imagined playing idols, pulling off mad blindsides, and somehow even though you're built like Keith from The Office, you imagine outlasting a professional athlete in an endurance challenge. But if you're also like me, you're quite content to keep it a fantasy. I mean, firstly, an average looking office worker whose closest thing to a sob story was that they once traded a legitimate Blast Toys EX for a counterfeit Charizard EX probably puts you out of the running. But secondly, you also just strongly suspect you'll get way too paranoid and that you blow it in the first five days. But it's for this exact reason that I don't get why CBS hasn't invested in a high quality Survivor video game. I mean, sure, there was this mediocre one, and yes, there was this absolute abomination, but there are so many fans that could turn a good campaign game into an absolute cash cow. You see, there are currently 6.5 million viewers watching Winners at War right now, and these are the hardcore fans that have hung around. You can bet that most of these fans would have an interest in a good Survivor video game. But for argument's sake, let's just jump out of America. Australian Survivor had 1 million viewers this year for its all-star season. Spanish Survivor had 3 million, and if you add up all the countries, you have viewership in the tens of billions for the international Survivor franchise. Again, I think it's safe to say that more than half of these fans would love to live out their Survivor fantasies in a good video game. Many soccer fans play Football Manager to play out their coaching fantasies. Many basketball fans play 2K to play out their playing fantasies. Is it not safe to assume that many Survivor fans would play this game to live out their blindside fantasies? And with a fan base in the tens of millions, I honestly think a Survivor campaign game could easily rival Football Manager 2019, which sold over 2 million copies and made Sega a ton of money. And just to emphasize this point, I don't care about earning a single cent from this. If someone takes this idea and uses it to make a ton of profit, I'll honestly just be stoked to get a good Survivor video game. I only aim to be a one-hit wonder with this channel, I just want a Survivor video game. And in this video, I'll explain how it is totally possible. So if you watch this video and you find that you're in agreement, please share it around. I just want to get this to CBS and ultimately help them make a ton of money in the process. What if there was a Survivor game that was good? Like what if there was a Survivor game that was really, really good? Here's how it could be done. So like I said, this is a pitch for a single player game. A multiplayer game could perhaps come later, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll stick to single player for now. And so we begin with the setup of our Survivor game and we have three options that we can go with. Now I'm not in any way skilled with design, so just imagine these looking way more aesthetic done by a proper developer. And so option number one is that we pick an existing season to replay. And let's just say, for argument's sake, the developers put five pre-made seasons into the game. So just off the top of my head, say they have Heroes vs Villains, Winners at War, uh, China, Borneo, and Game Changers in there. Now, you can either select an existing player to control, so say if you're playing Heroes vs Villains, you could select Rupert to control, or you can create your own player to enter in place of another cast member. So say I created Keith, Keith would take the spot of, I don't know, Colby on the Heroes Tribe, and we play Heroes vs Villains. So that's option number one. Now, option number two is that you customize the type of game that you play. So firstly, you select the cast. You can either choose uh, from a database of returning players, you can choose from players that you've created yourself, or you can add computer generated players into the game that are kind of developed quite randomly. Next thing you can do is you can choose the setting. So say you have selection of beach one, it's like a white sandy beach, beach two, a more yellowy beach, beach three, rainforest setting, outback setting, etc. So you choose the setting. Number three, you tick the boxes for the twists in the game. So say a big pop down box appears, and it has a bunch of twists that you can either tick off to have in your game or that you can ignore to not have in your game. So let's just say you tick tribe swaps, edge of extinction, tribal council twists, and fire tokens. Now the next thing you do is you can choose the tribes. So you choose the color of the tribes, the name of the tribes, and then you sort who is in each tribe. And then lastly, you choose the title of your season. So you can have Survivor Season 41, Keith. Now for option number three, we've had pre-made seasons, we've had customized seasons, and so our third option is just to totally randomize the season. Let the computer randomly enter everything, so random tribes, uh, random cast members, random settings, and then random twists as well. That one's pretty self-explanatory. Now perhaps some of that customization might need to be limited, but you get the point. Now what I want to focus on is creating an algorithm that allows the proper survivor strategic and social gameplay. The bread and butter of survivor is its strategy and its characters. And so here's how I reckon that could work. Each player has attributes and values. I'll unpack how the mechanics will work later on in the video, but each player gets into the game with a set of attributes and a set of values. And so let's take Russell Hands for example. 
His game is very well known and going into a season, you know how you would pitch moves to him. You wouldn't need to spend time building a relationship, you would try and get on his side early and then pitch strategic moves. Russell would enter the game with his values and attributes on display. But what if, say, Brett from Survivor Samoa came back? He's only played once, so his game is a little less known than Russell's. So say for Brett, you'd have a range of attributes and perhaps one or two values that you know going into the game. And then lastly, a computer-generated player is a new player to the game. You have no idea what their attributes and values are the same way that when you see a new player come onto Survivor, you have no idea how they're going to play and you have no idea what kind of pitches will work for them. Now, the idea is that after each tribal council, these parameters get narrower and narrower. In FIFA's manager mode, you don't know every player's stats. You have to scout them and over the course of a month in the game, you begin to find out what their speed is like, what their shooting is like, what their passing is like. The same process could happen for this. Just like in real Survivor with new players, you're totally in the dark on how to pitch moves to this person until you've had a few tribal councils. So to make this video as easy as possible to understand, we've created Survivor Season 41 Keith, it's a Legend Seasons, and all the big players are coming back to play for Survivor Season 41. Okay, so before we enter the game, we create our player's appearance, we decide their name, we dress them up, whatever else, and then we assign 10 skill points across the two attributes that are relevant for challenges. Physicality and skill. Now there's a third one there called determination. That is only relevant for CPU players because you decide how determined you are. And so what happens is you get 10 skill points at the start and you can assign these skill points how you want. You can put five on skill, five on physicality, you can put eight on physicality, two on skill, it's up to you. Now what happens is, as you win rewards, you actually increase these skill points. So say you play for burgers and for two skill points, that's one of the rewards. And so say you get those two skill points, you can boost your physicality by two, you can go one and one, or you can boost your skill by two. As well, getting food will boost your physicality. If you're winning rewards and being well fed, your physicality is going to increase. If you find a lot of food back at camp, your physicality is going to increase. If you go hungry back at camp, that physicality is going to decrease. So we enter the game and begin with the opening challenge for Flynn. Now I won't spend heaps of time on challenges because honestly, I reckon this would be the easiest part of the game to make. For physically based challenges, you could borrow heaps from sports and Olympics games. And then for skill based challenges, you could borrow heaps from skating and timing based games. Puzzles are also fairly easy to design to do digitally. Now essentially during the pre-merge you control your whole tribe, but for the merge itself you control just your player. Now your ability to do physically based challenges as a tribe would depend on your tribe's total physicality, and then for skill challenges your tribe's cumulative skill level. For endurance challenges as well, rivals' determination will greatly influence how long they stay in the game, and so it might influence how long you have to hold, say, the right analog stick at a certain point of tension if you're competing in an individual balance challenge. So the challenge ends and you're now back at camp and this is what we're all waiting for. So let's just say that each day at camp corresponds to 15 minutes. From sunrise to sundown, you have 15 minutes to best use your time with the option to skip once you're satisfied with the amount of moves you've made on a certain day. So it's a small open world style and there's essentially four different ways you can use your time. Now let's take JT for example and say you approach him by the beach. Now JT is orange because it's day one. But say you voted with JT for the first tribal council, this would move towards green along the spectrum. If you voted against JT and it wasn't part of a split vote, it would move more towards red. The more you socialize with JT, the more it moves back towards the green. The less you socialize with JT, the more it moves back towards the red. Now for people who value social, quicker losses and gains can be made by socializing with that person. And for people who value strategy, Quicker gains and losses can be made by getting a voting record that corresponds to theirs. So your first and most obvious move is to strategize and to suggest a name as to who you want to vote out. That's probably all our favorite part of the game. And so for the sake of logistics, let's say a menu drops down with your tribe members. And so you select the tribe member that you most want to vote out, but you have to provide a reason. Now, the reason is the money maker. The reason will decide whether this move will go ahead or whether it will crumble and fall and come back in your face. And so we have to account for a range of factors. Factor number one, is the reason logical? If Chicken has like two charisma, the reason that he's a social threat won't actually hold any water with someone who has strong logic points. Alternatively, if the person you're pitching to is low in logic, you can pitch any reason and it'd have a decent chance of coming off. So number one, is it a logical move? Factor number two, does it go against their values? 
If JT values try strength, suggesting someone with nine physicality probably won't go down too well. Does your move align with their values? Factor number three, what's your existing relationship like with the person? If the relationship with JT is moved more towards the red, it's gonna have less of a chance of coming off. If it's more towards the green, it's gonna have a better chance of coming off. Factor number four, what's their showmanship like? For example, JT has really high showmanship and values flashy moves. So voting someone on the basis of them being a threat would give a decent chance of convincing him to vote your way. Again, are you pitching to what the person values? And factor number five, does JT have an existing relationship with Chicken? You see, if JT was high in loyalty and had a green relationship with Chicken, getting him to flip on Chicken would not be easy. You have to account for all of these factors. Now, I don't know a thing about code, but surely some algorithm could be built upon attributes, values, JT's relationship with others, and your relationship with JT. Surely an algorithm could be made out of that. So after you pitch your move to JT, you get a red, orange, or green response. This will either move your relationship up or down the spectrum with him, but it's not that simple. JT has really high unpredictability. So even though he's given you a green response and your relationship is good, he could be playing you. You're gonna to have to make a decision as to whether JT's response is actually trustworthy. Now, as you roam the island, other contestants will come up to you where you can give them a red, orange, or green response to their pitch, again, adjusting your relationship with them. But if people come up to you, wouldn't you just always go green so that you build a good relationship with them? Well, not necessarily. You see, if you go green for everyone and then backflip on those decisions, you are gonna end up really annoying some people, especially if they're high in loyalty or if they value honor. Now, the other possibility is that you might be holding an idol and you wanna make everyone go red so that they vote against you. And because they vote against you and you play your idol, you get to decide the outcome of tribal council. Again, there's endless possibilities as to how you might play this, just like the real game. Won't it be easy to work out how to play the system and just make it a numbers game? Well, remember at the start, you are going in blind. You have no idea what's gonna work with people and there's no way everything can go your way. You're going to have to prioritize some people at the expense of others. Adjustable difficulty could keep stats hidden for longer or limit the amount of time you have on the beach. Okay, so admittedly, I think the social game is the hardest factor of the game to work, but I think there's definitely some capacity to incorporate it. Let me know what you think or if you reckon you can expand upon this idea, but let's just say you press square and start socializing with JT. And this drop down menu appears and it has JT's background, job, interests, and family. What I imagine are the four main conversation topics on Survivor. So let's just say you press interest and see that JT is interested in football. Now you feel that you actually have a bit of a knowledge about the NFL, so you try to talk to him about the NFL. I don't, but let's just say you do. So you feel you know a bit about the NFL and the first question that JT asks you is who do you support? Now, based on the city that you entered the start of the game, four options will appear and it functions as kind of a trivia based game. So say you answered Keith from LA, you might get the options of the LA Clippers, the LA Lakers, the LA Dodgers, and the Los Angeles Rams, and you have five seconds to answer the question to stop you from Googling which of these is actually an NFL team. So if you answer Clippers, Lakers, or Dodgers, your relationship with JT actually worsens because obviously you're not talking about football, you're talking about baseball and basketball. Now, if you answer the Rams, then that improves. Uh, now, the severity of increase and decrease depends on whether they value the social game or not. JT values strategy more than the social game, so the increases and decreases won't be quite so severe. Now, this process lasts for about five questions or so, and each question gets more and more sophisticated. And so, say the next question you might get asked is, what did you think of Super Bowl 2017? I don't know if that's the correct vernacular, by the way. I'm not really into American sports, but I think you use numbers rather than the year. But let's just say for purposes of ease of understanding, uh, what did you think of Super Bowl 2017? You might have the choices of, say, number one, Richard Sherman was unbelievable, which Richard Sherman didn't play in that Super Bowl. Number two, Atlanta really choked in that one, which is true. Number three, Tom Brady is unbelievably good. Tom Brady was great in that Super Bowl game. And then number four, New Jersey had a great postseason. Again, it was New England, not New Jersey, who played in that Super Bowl. So again, two of those answers are correct responses, which help build the relationship. Two are incorrect, which worsen it. Now, obviously this requires a huge database of questions to avoid it becoming repetitive, but it's not like it hasn't been done before. Football's manager press conference function has thousands of questions. So a dedicated team of writers could write a ton of questions over a ton of topics, and it could really make for quite interesting social gameplay. 
Okay, so that's strategic and social gameplay. Now, a third way to spend time on the beach is to scavenge. And this can be done with others or it can be done solo, but it would really be where the open world gameplay would come right into its own. You see, the premise is pretty simple. You can go out into the water and spearfish, you can climb trees to get coconuts, you can gather firewood, you can get bamboo to bolster your shelter, you can try and catch a chicken. The possibilities are endless. I'm sure you can add more examples than that. Now, providing for your tribe improves your relationship with them, but keeping your findings for yourselves provides you with food to boost your physicality. Again, just like a real survivor, it's a moral dilemma. Do you keep the findings for yourself and try and boost your physicality, or do you try and share it with the tribe and build relationships with them? Now, if you go off with someone, you only get half the credit for providing, but you can also scavenge more in your limited time period. And so lastly, but very importantly, we have hidden immunity idols, one of the best parts of Survivor. Now, idols are hidden throughout your open world map for you to find. So say with JT, we press triangle and then other options come up. Firstly, you can tell JT that you have the idol. This will improve your relationship with him, but you also risk him telling everyone else that you have it. Secondly, you can recruit JT to help you look for an idol. Now this boosts your chances of finding it, but again, you risk it falling into JT's hands. Another survivor risk. But also, you knowing that someone else has the idol puts you in a position of power, so there's that reason that's going for it as well. Now, clues for the idol can be found in the usual spots too. Clues for the idol can be found during challenges, on rewards, or during survivor auctions, the usual places. Now, you only have 15 minutes each day to find it, so a long search that shows up empty could cost you valuable relationship building time. Okay, so you have 15 minutes on day one. Day two, you have your immunity challenge, you lose that challenge, and now there's just 10 minutes until tribal. So the time between challenge and tribal is cut down to 10 minutes because you only have an afternoon in the real game. Now, you obviously use that last 10 minutes wherever you see fit, but for the purposes of this video, let's just say you find a hidden immunity idol just before tribal. Now, you walk into tribal and it's very cinematic. Jeff asks you to dip your torch in fire. Fire represents your life in the game, all of that stuff. But your first option at tribal council is actually to reveal your idol before it actually begins. You might want to send a message, might try and serve as a bluff for everyone, but obviously that's dumb gameplay for night two. So for the purpose of this video, you press no. Now, Jeff asks his series of, say, eight questions. I know in the real thing, it's a lot more than eight. It's like hours long, but it's edited down to about eight questions or so. And so let's just say out of those eight questions that Jeff asks, two of them are directed towards you and the way that you answer them either boosts or worsens your relationship with the person the questions aim towards. For example, Jeff might ask, Keith, what did you make of Sandra's performance on the puzzle today? The subtext being that Sandra blew it big time on the puzzle. Now, these are the three answers you could give. Number one, we win as a team and lose as a team. Number two, she cost us immunity. Number three, we need tribe strength right now. Now, one of those answers boosts your relationship with Sandra and two worsen it. But that's a very softball question. Okay, so let's move to something tougher. For example, Jeff might say to you, Keith, chicken saying, keep me around, I'm good for morale. What do you make of that argument? To which you could respond with, number one, he makes a good point. Number two, he's too much of a social threat. Number three, I'd love to have Chicken still around. Now, you're worried that Chicken also has an idol. So you want him feeling as secure as possible. So you say that you still want Chicken around and your relationship with Chicken boosts. It goes more towards the green. The risk of this is that Chicken values honor. So if everything goes pear-shaped, your relationship goes strongly to the red. Now, Jeff is also asking other people similar questions and you use those questions to try and get some intel on how the rest of the tribe is gonna vote. So Parvati might say something like, don't play too hard too soon. Rob might say that tonight's vote is about flushing out an idol. Now, obviously it's too tough to record everyone's voice, so the text is fine. But now you're worried that they're targeting you because they talk about idols and big players. And so Jeff says that it's time to vote and so you select the person that you most want to vote for, that being Chicken. Now, after the votes have been tallied, Jeff comes back and does his usual thing. If anyone has a hidden immunity idol and wants to play it, now would be the time to do so. You press yes and you select play the idol on Keith because you're worried that Poverty and Rob are gunning for you. Now the votes are read out and four go to you and six go to Chicken. Chicken is voted out of the game. You see, the time that you spend strategizing and socializing with Russell, JT, Sandra, Tony and Sari paid off and now your relationship with them shifts even further towards the green while Rob, Poverty and Kim who voted for you moves further towards the red. And that would be the basic format that the game would follow. 
Now for some final details. So when you voted out, that is the end of your Saliva campaign. Your torch is snuffed and you have to start another one. Unless you do that save and restart your console thing that you often do in sports games if you can't hack losing a big match. So if you get voted out during the merge, it jumps straight to the final two or final three and you cast a vote for who you want to win. Now, if you make the final two slash final three, your chances of receiving the jury member's vote are entirely dependent on how far along that red green spectrum your relationship with that jury is. If it's closer to the green than your rival, then you're getting that jury's vote. If it's closer to the red than your rival, your rival is getting that jury member's vote. So they ask you questions where like in trial where your answer increases or decreases this relationship. Now, if you blindsided someone like Chicken that values honor, you're probably not getting their vote. But if you blindsided someone like JT that values flashy moves, it'll actually remarkably boost that relationship. I guess in modern Survivor, we see jury members often give their vote to people that blindsided them because they respect devious gameplay. So just like Survivor, jury management has to be incredibly personalized to each jury member. I also think there's heaps of potential for things like Survivor auctions, random twists like steal a vote, moral dilemmas, and so forth. Now, it's probably a bit too tough to do family visits and definitely too tough to do some ultra sophisticated moves like secret messaging by underlining a name in the vote count, but I feel a model like this would still leave huge potential to play the game exactly how you want to play it. And most of all, I want your feedback. How could you expand or adjust these key ideas to make a great Survivor video game that mechanically works? Look, it might be a long shot, but if you've even played Survivor, what do you reckon of a game like this? How could it be adjusted to make an even more realistic experience? If you want to survive a video game, please like and share this video and help start the conversation. Now, I have no interest in making a YouTube channel. I have no interest in getting subscribers. I'm not going to ask you to subscribe because that makes no difference to me. I have no interest in getting ad revenue. I just love to live my survivor dreams in a good video game. So let's get hashtag make survivor game again trending and let's get this to CBS's attention. I'd love to take you on in some sort of survivor video game.